down and grabbed his old box call after the turkey started gobbling in the morning first thing and he went turkey gobbled, he reached down, put it back in his bath, poured himself a cup of coffee, and we're sitting close enough. I said, you know, what do you think? How much are you going to call? Oh, he knows we're here. <laughs> well, about what seemed like nine hours later, about two hours later, sure enough, this Tom come back, and he never made a peep. We never had a decoy out. That turkey remembered that noise and come back, and he shot it. So you don't have to call every time you hear a noise or anything like that. I'd have been at seven sets by then. Oh, <laughs> me too. I'd have been at three, seven different ranches. Yeah. But <laughs> it works. So do not overcall. I think that's one of the most frustrating things. In, in my line of work, I'm able to hunt with a lot of guys from around the country and some of these, you know, competition turkey callers. And <laughs> I tell you, they're the most annoying people to hunt with because they want to hear themselves call. You know, well, I won this competition, that competition. You know, listen, and they're good. They're way better than I am. But I'll tell you, some of the worst calls out there are made from turkeys themselves. It just comes down to what Jody says, and that's knowing the birds and their behavior and, and calling based on their behavior, not how good you are or how good you think you are. Um, it, it can be annoying, and it can blow a lot of sets. So if one thing, don't be afraid to get out there and call and make mistakes. <coughs> Um, you know, Jody mentioned um, earlier when these birds are, are in the trees. But when the hens are in the trees, they're going to make what's called a tree yelp before they before they start flying down. And it's just a soft yelp. Okay? It's a real soft yelp, and they're communicating with one another, saying, you know, everything's good here. You know, how are things where you are? You know, they're, they're, they're good. Then pretty soon the, the toms are going to start gobbling. It's a real soft yelp, but they're communicating, saying everything's good. We're ready to fly out of the trees. Then they hit the ground, a lot of times they, they just they shut down. They don't, they don't talk, they don't gobble or anything. Might be for 15, 20 minutes. Then again, they might be real aggressive. You don't know what you're getting into with a turkey all the time. They're very different birds from the, way, from the way they will behave from one to another. Once they start hitting the ground, you know, then, then their yelps will be a little more aggressive. A little bit louder, a little more crisp, a little more you know, authority behind it. Now, they're not as vocal in, in the spring as they are in the fall. You want to learn about turkey talk, go out in the fall and hunt them. That's when they're incredibly vocal because you have uh, the hens, you have the, um, the young of the year, and they're communicating, they're trying to uh, you know, stay together as flocks, and you have flocks that are joining up to spend the winter together. There's a lot of birds are very, very vocal, way more vocal in the fall than they are in the spring. But the spring is when we like to hunt them because of the gobble. So what is the gobbling saying? Well, the gobbling, like Jody said, that's the tom, you know, communicating to other toms, saying, hey, this is my territory, get out of here. They're also saying to the hen, hey, I'm here, so you come, you know, you come and we'll, you know, take care of the breeding. So what we're doing is being, being hens, it's a lot different. Now, I know a lot of times when I've been with Jody, and Jody, you know, says that he doesn't overcall. I, I overcall a lot more than Jody does. A lot of it's because of time. Uh, with the TV shows that we've shot over the year, so over the years, my time is very limited. And so I, I need to get from point A to point B. And I'm amazed at how aggressive I can be. I still blow a lot of things. But how aggressive we can be and not only call birds in, but, but what we can get away with in terms of using uh, um, decoys, for instance. A lot of decoys, when we place decoys, we'll place them 10 feet from the blind. I mean, you know, from, from me to the front row. And, and we're bow hunting them out of a blind, a big blind that we just set right there. And the decoys are right there. Um, the blinds, they're not like, you know, antelope um, or sometimes deer where you have to go set them up, you know, two, three weeks in advance. A turkey, you can set the blind up right there, which is what's so great about them because sometimes their roosting trees do change. Jody said that he has trees, you know, where these birds will roost year after year. There are places where I've walked, I'm not kidding you, the droppings under the tree are a foot and a half deep. And, and you dig down in through, all the, in through all the humus and all the dirt and it's just solid turkey droppings. They've been there for years and years. But those birds, they can move from time to time. And as their winter flocks start breaking up, and, and some of the, um, um, the, I guess, two-year-old birds start establishing dominance, they're going to get into their different roosting areas, too. So that's where it's nice to be able to have a blind and be mobile if you're bow hunting, um, or be mobile, you know, with a backpack with, with some turkey decoys if you're a, um, you know, if you're a gun hunter. So we'll talk a little bit more about decoy placement. Um, when you start calling, what are some of the things you like to start off with? When I start calling, mm -hmm. we're gonna talk you're, more about decoy placement. Your first setup of the morning, we'll talk. Okay, let's. We're talk. gonna do decoy placement. Be quiet. Okay, decoys first. <laughs> De decoys. These are one of those things that uh, um, sometimes you love them, sometimes you hate them. There's uh, a couple decoys that I've been using the last few years, <laughs> and and with every setup that we've um, called, we kind of use these decoys in five different states. Every setup that we've used, I've only had one. Tom that's come in and seen the decoys and run off. Everything else has been a slam dunk. 
you know, kill or they've come in. Uh, but I've talked to other people that have used the same decoys and, you know, five out of, you know, six birds they call come in and see the decoys and take off. Um, and that's hard to say why without seeing their placement. Personally, when I, when I try to set up decoys, I present them after when we have time to have a take. Yeah, it's gone by. Yeah. Personally, when I, we, and we have a hand decoy over here too. These are nice, these are feather flies. Uh, yeah. I, I like these because um, they just roll up in your pack. I want to wrap the hen with the same thing right here. Uh, I like trying to have a hen and a decoy set up, and that's because if you think about what's going on behaviorally with the birds right now, um, that you want to try, try to create um, uh, uh, something that gets their attention. Yeah, family, if you will. So I try to, if I'm bow hunting, for instance, and say this table is our blind, or if they're hunting out of a tree stand, I try to set these things up where we can call them, pull them by us. So I want the, the, the hen, if I want the tom to be coming from this way, I want them to be looking at the birds going away as they come by me. So as they go, so as the birds come in and start going away, they're going to focus their attention on the birds which are on the other side of me. That way when they start strutting and going around the decoys, they're, they're by me so I can get the full draw without being seen. Um, at the same time, um, if you can pull those birds by you with confidence, um, it's just going to put them at ease that, you know, that they walk right by your blind um, or, or underneath your tree stand. It's very hard to, to kill a bird out of a tree stand, by the way. If we're setting, <laughs> if we're, if I'm um, hunting um, out of a tree stand for these birds, I want to try to get the tr this stand on the back side of the tree. I don't want to be where I can see them. Not I, I won't set up a tree stand for a bow hunt well, I will, at the same place I would for a shotgun hunt. Because a shotgun, boom, you, you know, there's no movement, you just pull the trigger. A tree stand's a little different. So I want the bird to come by me and I'm going to put the tree stand on the back side of the tree, whatever, wherever that is in relationship to the decoy. So that the bird's already gone by me, I can come the full draw when he's facing away from me. Because they will look up. Birds look up a lot. Um, not, not, uh, deer, deer, you know, don't look up near uh, the amount that, that birds do. And they have, like Jody said, incredible eyesight. So in terms of setting up decoys, there's a lot of different combinations that are out there now. Uh, and a lot of them are good. And and most of my hunts, I would say over 90% of the time, the tom will come down beak to beak with the jake decoy. They come down to strut up. I've seen them fly from 100 yards and hit these and knock it off. I've seen them, like I used a pretty boy, which Scott was I think, talking about some. Um, it's one of the newer decoys with a full tail. It's a, a dominant bird. It's supposed to well, work well for mature toms. I have had poor experience with it. Scott's phoning me up. Yeah. Boy, you can't believe it. Yeah. it. I've had them come in, and I know they would have come in without even a decoy being there. They crested over the hill, they saw this decoy, they shut off and blasted out of there. I don't know why. But when you set your Jake decoy up, if you're an archery hunter, it's better to have, of course, you don't want them looking at you because even in the blind, a little movement, a little noise or something. Once they get in there and get kind of fighting or interested in the Jake decoy, it's, it's hard to scare them away. Um, but if you can face it so where it's facing at you a little bit instead of away from you, as far as turning up your blinds, say at this table, you don't want to face this Jake decoy facing this way because the bird's going to be looking at you somewhat. So if you can face it this way for archery, you get a good broadside shot with it facing away from you. I've had very good luck placing the decoys there, especially for younger hunters. A lot of them sometimes move a little bit more than what you'd like, but it doesn't seem to spook them. So that's one. One thing I would suggest when you are putting your decoys up, and don't put them so far away, like Scott's talking at 10 yards, put them, don't put them at 30 yards if you can shoot at 30 yards. Because a lot of times they'll hang up 15 yards behind them. Well, you got the decoy in your hand, and you're talking about arrow mm -hmm. archery. Where are you going to hit that bird? <laughs> He's killed way. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I can do that. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, tur turkeys, turkeys are billward, and uh, you know, a little different than big game. All, all the vitals of birds are against their back. Um, you know, their lungs. Yeah, yeah. When, you know, when when you go to clean them out, think of where they're at when you field dress them. Um, you know, their, their lungs. You're digging them out of the ribs that are right tight against the back. So if I'm if I'm you know shooting these things with a bow, I'm going to be shooting right where the right where the crease of the wing is. Just right above that, that's going to be a, a high lung shot there. If it's something that's straight on, I'm going to shoot right where the, and the bird is in full strut, that's going to put his body kind of kind of horizontally right there. So I'm shooting right where the beard attaches on. 